Anyone here familiar with the DOS command part.exe? In short, due to how hard drives were structured and functioned back in the days, it was a command to park them safely before turning off the computer. I always enjoyed typing these letters because I was greeted with a cute illustration of a girl on a bed of flowers. And this was my first exposure to Princess Maker 1. Welcome everyone to my first episode of Bringing Up Life Sims, a series where I analyze and review life simulation games of old and somewhat new. Let's begin with what started the whole trend of the bishoujo nurturing genre of the 90s. I know I'm guilty of reviewing some games that could be a bit inaccessible, but today's subject is readily and legally accessible for all of you folks. In fact, Princess Maker Refine and its official English translation has been on Steam since 2017. Whether you bothered to click the thumbnail or was washed up on here by the demon that is the YouTube algorithm, you probably know about Princess Maker and how it changed video game history. No? Then at least you must have heard of Gainax. Yes, that Gainax, the creative force behind the Neon Genesis Evangelion franchise. In the 80s, Gainax was a budding group of talented anime and tokusatsu otakus, but by 1988, they were facing a major deficit after bombing their first commercial film, The Royal Space Force, The Wings of One Amis. Their next project, an OVA series known as Gunbuster, did so decently. However, it was not enough to recover from the Royal Space Force deficit. At that crucial time, one of the founders of Gainax, Akai Takami, convinced then-president of the company, Okada Toshio, to enter into the PC gaming industry. Note that back then, PC gaming otakus who also liked anime was a very specific niche, but they did overlap slightly. PC 88 and 98 were never short of erogues, but by that time, major developers had moved on to greener pastures, resulting in most of them looking like… this. Akai's plan was applying their expertise in animation to create a highly visually appealing PC game. In his words, Gainax could be compared to a small dog while the anime tokusatsu industry is the African continent. A little dog cannot survive in the African savanna, but it may reign on top of the food chain in a more isolated ecosystem, such as… Australia. The PC gaming market was its down under, and thus, Gainax launched Project Australia. In 1989, Denno Gakuen, aka Cybernetic High School, was released for the PC-88 and PC-98. The game itself was a strip quiz game made of simple right and wrong options, but combined with its appealing character graphics, the game became a bestseller despite the hefty price of 8,800 yen. Denno Gakuen was soon followed by the video game adaptation of Asami Akiya's hit manga, Silent Mobius, more stripping games such as sequels to Denno Gakuen and Super Battle Skin Panic, and finally, in May 24, 1991, we got our first Princess Maker. The idea behind the game was simple. Combine construction simulators like SimCity with a leveling up system from RPGs like Dragon Quest, then remove everything else to focus on a single character, and the concept proved itself to be genius. Princess Maker 1 and 2 became a massive hit, so successful that it went far beyond rebuilding Gainax from the bottom up. The game's cultural influence expanded throughout East Asia, including South Korea and its booming PC industry. Princess Maker and the entire number series received an official release with Korean translations, and with the help of our good old pirate friends, every 90s kids, including the so-called normies, got to know about Princess Maker 2. However, the legacy came to an end with Gainax snubbing the gaming department following their phenomenal success of Evangelion. After releasing Princess Maker 3, Akai established Nine Lives, which was Gainax's subsidiary company focusing on game development. But due to Princess Maker 4 and 5's mediocre performance, Akai came back to Gainax and released yet another life simulation game named Ramen Goddess in 2015. But it seemed that the genre has outlived its glory days, and reportedly the game itself was quite bad. Ramen Goddess ceased all sales in 2017, and as far as I know, it's quite rare to acquire, even the pirated versions. I'm reluctant to say, the Princess Maker series did make somewhat of a comeback. In November 2012, South Korean developer M Games released a mobile game titled Princess Maker Social, which lasted about a year and a half. In May 2014, the same developer released a spin-off of the second game, also in mobile, titled Princess Maker for Kakao. I quit after a few days since I personally find the pay-to-win mechanic and the forced time management system repulsive. But leeching off nostalgia proved effective and the game was successful enough to continue its service until April 2022. Compared to its legendary status, the Steam version of Princess Maker has an overall mixed reception as of January 2023, at least according to these 300-something reviewers. Which seems odd, but perhaps the game suffered from a poor adaptation problem. It's a common occurrence among retro remakes and Princess Maker had adaptation issues in the past. 
But before getting into this topic, first let me give a quick introduction on how this game works. In Princess Maker, you are a young hero who saved the kingdom from the demon army's invasion. The king offered the hero the position of general, but he declined. Instead, the hero chose to retire and devote the rest of his life in helping children who were scarred and orphaned by the scourge of war. So the king granted him a modest house with an additional $500, which is exactly the right amount of cash to purchase three bunny plushies, and presumably covered his living costs just enough to support him and one other person. The hero then adopts an orphan girl, her official name being Maria Lindbergh. You raise Maria for eight years. For each year, she has matching standing CGs and seasonal outfits. This created the impression that she is growing up before your eyes, which is just one of the many charming aspects of the series. Maria is given an abundance of stats. Stats are affected by doing part-time jobs and receiving lessons. High reputation is needed to achieve better ranked endings. Reputation is gained via performing perfectly in jobs, winning the annual Harvest Festival events, achieving degrees and titles in a specific field, having an audience with the king, and the most important of all, successfully completing errantry. Princess Maker 1 has 30 endings, not including the 3 additional endings available only on the MSX and PC Engine port. These additional endings include the series' infamous grooming ending where the hero, foster father, player stand-in marries the daughter, the Demon King's wife's ending, and an ending where Maria honors her father's wishes by building an orphanage. Each ending corresponds to Maria's reputation and her highest stats. Ironically, the two supposedly best endings, Princess and Queen Regent, are the most easily achievable because the only requirements are high reputation, and reputation can be easily accumulated by performing errantry. Of course, this does involve completing a full run of the errantry map multiple times, making the mid to the late part of the game a real slogfest. Now let's go back to the problem this game faced in the past surrounding its adaptation. Princess Maker was ported into MSX and PC Engine in 1992 and 1995 respectively, and in both versions, errantry is pretty much broken. The enemy's HP and level exponentially grows with every passing day until they become strong enough to render armor and high combat skills to moot. I had to completely rely on luck to beat the errantry map. There may exist a perfect strategy and I may be doing everything wrong, but I haven't yet found anything out, and those who did seem to be too shy to share. In a way, this version is more of a remake rather than a port. Princess Maker 1 for the MSX PC Engine was developed by Microcabin, probably most known in North America for Riddlor Saga, aka Mysteria the Realm of Lore, aka Blazing Heroes. Not only were the UI and sprites completely overhauled, but CGs containing nudity were redrawn, and sexual undertones in some of the texts were removed as well. Microcabin also added a fully voiced narration on the opening sequence. Maria is voiced throughout the game, and a voice narration is provided for all the endings. A welcoming change in my opinion, but a far reach from saving this adaptation from the frustrating errantry system, especially when it was such an integral part of the gameplay. But that… isn't the case for the Steam version of Princess Maker. While skimming through the most recent reviews, you might even notice that most of them are not even talking about the game. Content police, censorship, censored with a capital. Indeed. See, unlike the sequel, Princess Maker Refined kept the original graphics, albeit under an airbrushed and blurry filter. Since its release on February 2017, Princess Maker Refined received an update on July 2022 with revised English translations and a brand new opening by Akai Takami himself. You can see the noticeable change in his art style. Most negative reviews before the update stem from the inconvenient gameplay and unsolicited child nudity. Compared to that, more recent reviews delve on the nudity sensor patch that came with the aforementioned update. In actuality, they are the same graphics from the PS2 release of Princess Maker in 2004, which was a direct adaptation of Princess Maker Refine released for the PC in 2002, minus some NPC nipples. Considering both versions were first published in Japan back in the early 2000s, the latest censorship didn't have to be blown up as some kind of so-called culture war outcome. Unfortunately, it seemed to be perceived as such. In every Princess Maker series, you are gifted with a unique CG when going on a family vacation with your daughter. The CG changes depending on the season, location, and how old your daughter is. Few of these CGs in the original Princess Maker displayed underage nudity. Therefore, they were replaced with a censored image when the game was remastered in 2002 as Princess Maker Refined. I've witnessed a flame war ensuing on Princess Maker Refined's Steam discussion page over the removal of underage titties. If you've been around the weeb community for some time, these arguments supporting the exposure of underage nudity must sound quite familiar by now. 
that the game was not intended to be sexual in nature and such oversensitive reactions, especially based on prejudices over Japanese culture under the standards of so-called Western values, in consequence suppress art and the freedom of expression. Contrary to these claims, the English translation for Princess Make a Refine for Steam, as far as I am aware, is pretty much a direct translation of the original text. Therefore, the game retains content that may be deemed controversial by today's sensibility, allowing the player to subject Maria in some rather questionable situations. Like some of the children's nudity lovers pointed out, swimsuits may not exist in the fantasy world of Princess Maker, but neither should a hidden command to strip their daughter naked. Of course, some parents do verbally degrade their child in the guise of giving them a lesson, but I don't think kids will find pleasure while being physically disciplined like this game implies. And the needlessly exploitative content in one of the endings is a whole another problem. Every month, you're given an option to talk to Maria. You can be gentle, firm, or choose to lecture her. Being gentle decreases her gut stat. Being firm does the opposite. Lecturing… is absurd. The protagonist grows a bit of a booking man in him and berates Maria corresponding to her highest stat, taking the full don't get to cocky you little shit stance. If her moral stat is high enough, she feels humbled and gains extra moral. If her moral stat is low, she reacts like a normal human being and talks back at you, and then you're given an option to physically discipline her. Followed by some thwacking sound effects, which are omitted in the English translation, Maria screams in pain and her moral stat drops. And yet, you have an option to punish her more. Some violent words and sounds are spit out from the father and his beatings, followed by some more screams leads to a decrease in guts and moral. An alternative pattern exists when charm is her highest stat, and I remind you, charm in this game is a paraphrase of the Japanese word iroki, which directly translates to sexiness. And when the player disciplines her, she gets a boost on her charm stat. Discipline her further with some more slapping, and with a moan, she gets additional charm. To be fair, Princess Maker Refine removed the option to discipline her further so you can only beat her once. The English translation still tried really hard to maintain its problematic nature, so beating Maria and increasing her charm stat are still there. I was also curious on whether they changed the text on the infamous con artist ending, where Maria gets caught conning men and is brutally violated. They didn't. Even in the English-speaking part of the world, Maria really has it hard compared to the daughters from the later series. That particular ending includes unnecessary details about Maria being a virgin, which inadvertently reminded me of the sleazy inn, a part-time job Maria can take when she turns 16. The employer drops obvious hints that the job involves prostitution and Maria does randomly fall sick during her work. Then again, the hentai definition of virginity tends to be extremely specific, and having said that, I should stop because I'm probably grossing you guys out. But without regarding the naivety behind rationalizing the exhibition of underage nudity, I can personally understand why some people are upset over the censorship, but only in an emotional level. I grew up in the golden age of dating sims and eroge and the surge of bishojo culture. Many of us did, and if you were into Japanese subculture, exposure to some degree of blatant sexualization of fictional characters were unavoidable, with all the underage nudity and sexual undertones in anime and shonen manga, which is a genre of manga targeted elementary school aged boys. And I wasn't bothered too much. After all, the characters were older than me, and it was easy for me to overlook the problem assuming that big kids are doing big kid stuff. As the media I consumed became a part of me, these sentiments stuck with it, and I started to view every character as an amalgamation of tropes, and I surely wasn't aware that most of them were underage because that was the status quo. Which brings me back to the days when I first discovered the world of English slash fictions, and noticed the weird tendency of aging the characters up to adulthood in case they were minors in the original work. As a participant of the doujin scene at that time, I was baffled, treating it as an absurd attempt to exercise human rights on people who don't even exist while forcefully injecting them into a certain sexual orientation to satisfy the artist's desire. I still find that funny, but at least now I recognize the layers of influence any media can have over our reality, and I think in this context there's a better rationale behind aging up younger characters in a slash fiction than arguing against censoring underage girls' titties. But realizing that was more difficult than it should have been because my reality was shaped by what I consumed. And we all act emotionally, violently even, when our worldview is challenged. What I often hear about Princess Maker is that it was a part of their childhood innocence, and all these talk about hidden contents and their sexual innuendos ruin their memories. I'm not convinced. First, Gainax wasn't remotely discreet about their intentions. 
And second, in the peak of its popularity, talking about Princess Maker meant that you were crossing the forbidden realm, only one step away from actual pornography and talking about boobies. This was our childhood. Topless NPCs, monster tits, and the untapped power to take your daughter's clothes off. After replacing the closed data files with empty dummy files, what we get is not a generic silhouette paper doll placeholder, but a complete standing CG with detailed nipples and pubic hair. Remember these Princess Maker games operated on DOS, so it wasn't as simple as dragging and dropping files to a folder. People passed around a diskette containing the patched files to unlock 2D child nudies of their virtual daughter. This was made easier in Princess Maker 2, which simply requires deleting a certain file. Does the name DD, DR, D2 sound familiar to you? I did try it back in the day out of curiosity, and for this video. <clears throat> but it gets boring after a while. I feel like living in a nudist household. And it's not like Gainax were innocent artists who paid attention to details and some perverts happened to stumble onto it. The Windows port of Princess Maker 1 made stripping Maria even easier. Selecting Change Clothes while pressing F10 will reveal two hidden menus. One is a music listening mode, and the other is a strip her anyway option. Selecting this makes Maria bare naked. You cannot continue the game while she is naked in the Windows version though, since she goes meta and refuses to let you continue the game while she's naked. Princess Maker Refine kept the F10 plus change close command, but of course removed the strip option, leaving us only with the music listening menu. So Gainax always knew what was going on. Of course they did. Considering the content I cover in this channel, I had to discuss this topic sooner or later, and I'm afraid I might have to continue this discussion somewhere in the future. You might recognize Rory as a character trope, where the character is a type of bishoujo who are childlike in their aesthetics. But what if I tell you it's the other way around? Historically speaking, every bishoujos are their subspecies under the kingdom Rory. The word Rory derived from the term Rorita complex, which is a condition of feeling sexual attraction towards very young girls. The term popularized since the 1962 film Lolita, which were based on the 1955 book with the same title by Vladimir Nabokov. The word Rorikun is a Japanese abbreviation of Lolita complex, and the founding fathers of the Rorikun movement proudly and shamelessly declared themselves as Rorikuns. These Rorikuns claim that their fixation is limited to fictional characters in an attempt to differentiate Rorikuns from pedophiles. But from what we can learn from their doujinshis, early Dorikon certainly obsessed over books and films about grown men having platonic or often sexual relationships with little girls. Rorita doujin publications and doujin works, by that I mean self-published fanfic or fan art, existed before, but they remained under obscurity until the Rorikon movement gained a sudden popularity amongst the otaku starting in 1978, thanks to self-proclaimed Rorikon's Hirokogami Ken, Ajima Hideo, and his assistant Oki Yukao, who founded the Rorita erotic doujinshi Sibel, with the goal to drive yaoi out of Kamike. If you want the abridged history of yaoi, check out my review on St. Valentine's School. The typical Rory characters of the 80s were prepubescent to teenage girls with infantile features, such as having a big round face and eyes, a microscopic nose, and childlike body types. These arts mixed and matched to slowly evolve into what we now call bishoujo style. Aesthetically, they were heavily inspired by shoujo manga. Compare the girls featured in Sibel to shoujo style artwork in the 70s. You'll know exactly what I mean. Why? Probably because Row 34 was invented with the birth of art, and they likely found the shoujo style art to be most pleasing. Not surprising since the first manga artists who were invested in portraying women were women. Which is quite ironic since those self-proclaimed rorikons banded together in their hatred of an art form that was made and enjoyed by women. Even more so when back in the days, doujin events were mostly comprised of women. However, the Rorikon boom took over both the manga and gaming market and assimilated deep into the very roots of otaku culture. Following suit came the underage anime girl boobies which ended up defining the entirety of otaku culture to this day. Big game developers you may recognize, such as Enix and Koei, are graduates from the Rorikon wave. As much as they want you to forget, they once developed an erotic Lolita splatter game titled Lolita Complex and My Lolita in 1983 and 1984 respectively. Princess Maker was released in the midst of this time when otaku became synonymous with Lorikon, and every member of Gainax were hardcore otakus. Lori influence is clear as daylight on their Daikon 3 sword that put them in the spotlight. Princess Maker seems inappropriate today, not because we are oversensitive, not because some perverts projected their twisted interpretation to an innocent work of art, but because it was a game made by otakus who were completely aware they were doing otaku rorikon things. 
In his book, How to Draw Manga, Tezuka Osamu, the god of manga himself, advised authors to remember the following moral principles. Do not make mockery of the victims of war and disaster. Do not treat a certain profession with disrespect. Do not degrade a certain race, nation, or the masses. While he genuinely contemplated over the moral responsibilities of art and media, Tezuka was always a proponent of the freedom of expression, which is why he defended Nagaigo's Harenshi Gakuen. In the February 2, 1970 issue of Weekly Bunshun, he said the following, I think we should show more skin in our art. We need to teach kids how to be tough, and Nagai is doing the job our generation forgot to do. By the time of the Rorikon movement, Tezuka's moral principles have been jeered and mocked by the otakus, who only took the show more skins part to their heart. Yes, Princess Maker 1 is a good game. The game is simple and repetitive compared to its sequel, but nonetheless enjoyable. At the same time, Princess Maker is essentially a skin-showing game that sexualized a child. That's why despite how much I love this series, I can't simply ask anyone to overlook the problem and give this game a try. Princess Maker 2, on the other hand, took everything from its predecessor, improved upon the basics of this concept, and provides a much richer and detailed experience. But it does suffer from some of the same problems, namely underage boobies. Again. And that about does it. For now. Thanks for watching while I reminisced and spat out a bunch of vocabularies that might get me reported. Please reconsider. Hope you found this fun and or useful in some way. Be seeing you in the next video.